Now, some of you might, the mere thought of a creepy crawly, an eight-legged critter on the other side of the room might make your skin crawl and you recoil in fear. But if you're anything like Dr. Paula Cushing here, that same eight-legged BC on the other side of the room might send her into a full-on sprint across the room so she can get a better look at it before it scurries away. The world of arachnids is amazingly diverse and incredibly helpful to Earth's ecosystems. So today, while your fears might be valid, we're gonna try and turn some of those fears into some fascinations. Now, in a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Paula Cushing uh, so she can tell us all about what she studies. Uh, but we have a few light housekeeping tasks before we get started. So first of all, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science respectfully acknowledges that we are on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute nations. We also acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that comprise what is now Colorado, but who now live in the American Southwest, Great Plains, and the Rocky Mountain region. Now, we also want to acknowledge those of you that has joined, have joined us today. So welcome to everybody. If you have not done so yet, go ahead and type in the chat who you are, where you're from, and how many are with your group today. We're curious to learn more about you as well. Um, if you are one of our schools joining on camera today, we're going to ask that you guys stay muted. Oh, guess what? Newsflash, spoiler alert, we don't have any on school cameras or on camera schools today. So it's all through chat. Um, we love that you're here. If you have questions, go ahead and type them directly into the chat. I'm going to be monitoring that chat for you all. Uh, my one ask is that you only type your question once. With all the kids we have on the, the program and all the groups we have in our program today, if you type your question multiple times, the chat gets really overwhelming and the chances of me losing that question uh, or somebody else's question are pretty high. So please only ask your question once in the chat and I promise I'm gonna try and Dr. Cushing's gonna try to answer all of those, po those questions, as many as we possibly can. So if you are ready, I'm ready. without further ado, Dr. Paula Cushing, if you wouldn't mind telling us who you are, where we are, and what goes on down here. Absolutely, Amanda. So welcome to my lab. I am Dr. Paula Cushing, one of the scientists who works here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and the scientists who work here are called curators. That means that we not only carry out original research and our scientists who are doing research, but we also take care of collections, collections that are behind the scenes, collections of objects, and in my case, of specimens. And behind me, you can see one of my collections rooms. These giant yellow cabinets that you see, those cabinets house the arachnid specimens that I take care of, that I care for. And I also do research. I also do outreach programs like this one. So I talk to people about the animals that I love and the animals that I study. And I, uh, I do research, I do research primarily these days on arachnids called camel spiders. And I'm holding one of the camel spiders right here in my hand in, from, from the collection. And uh, arachnids, so let me explain what these animals are and kind of explain sort of how they are organized uh, amongst the species that we find on earth. So I study, these organisms that, well, let me back up and say that scientists being very orderly people, we love to order life on earth and species on earth in different categories. These categories are called taxonomic categories. So from the most inclusive category to the least inclusive, those categories are kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So everything that I study is in the kingdom Animalia. They're animals like we are. They're in a group called the phylum arthropoda. And that phylum, that big, huge group, includes not just the arachnids, but it also includes insects, millipedes, centipedes, crabs, crustaceans. It includes any organisms that have an outside exoskeleton and jointed legs. Our skeleton is on the inside of our body. These animals, their skeleton is on the outside. So my animals are in the kingdom Animalia, phylum arthropoda class. There's within that phylum, there's a bunch of different classes. These animals are in the class arachnida. And, and almost all arachnids are characterized as having eight legs. They have front appendages called pedipalps. They have jaws called chelicerae. 
Within that class Arachnida, there are 12 different orders. So those Solifugi that I just showed you, the camel spiders are in the order Solifugi. They're in one of those orders. We also have spiders that are in a different order. Spiders are in the order Arrhenii, and here's a giant spider that we have in the collection. This is a tarantula. So spiders are in the order Arrhenii, different order within that class Arachnida. We have scorpions. Let's see if I can find my scorpion. Scorpions are in the class Scorpiones. So that's in, in, in the, sorry, in the class Arachnida, the order Scorpiones. So it's a different order within that class Arachnida. We also have in that class Arachnida, the order Thelophonida, which are commonly called uh, whip scorpions or vinegaroons. So like all other arachnids, they have two major body parts, not three like we see in insects. They have four walking legs. They have a pair of front appendages. In this case, their front appendages are very spiny. Those are called the pedipalps. And they're called vinegaroons because they have this crazy whip-like tail that you see on this animal. And at the base of that whip-like tail is a gland that produces concentrated acetic acid or vinegar. And if a mammal or a bird or something that attacks arthropods were to attack this vinegaroon, it would use that whip-like tail to aim the gland at the face, hopefully the face, of the attacking arthropod predator and squirt vinegar in its face to get away. Another really cool arachnid, these are, this animal is called, uh, is in the order Amblypigi. It's also called a whip spider or whips whip scorpion but it's a different order of arachnids in the class arachnida and I've, I've also you know like like the other arachnids two major body parts eight walking legs a pair of really super spiny uh front pedipalps and they use those spiny pedipalps let me see if i can turn it so you can see those pedipalps better those spiny pedipalps they use to to grab onto and poke holes into the insects that they feed upon these animals are cool because, well, they're all cool, but these are cool because their front legs are very super long. These are the antenniform legs that you see in the vial. And those front pair of legs, they don't use them to walk. Instead, they hold them out in front of them and move them around, kind of like insects use their antennae. And they function the same way to tell what's going on around themselves in the environment. So these are some of the animals that I study in the class Arachnida and all these different orders. So Paula, we already had a question come in. Why are the specimens in liquid? And that's from Miss Keating's class. Oh, so that's a good question. So this liquid is actually alcohol, um, alcohol, ethanol. And we use this liquid to preserve the specimen so it doesn't rot. Uh, we put it in liquid and liquid preservative uh, because if we were to pin it, like you pin insects to keep them in collections, the, the legs are pretty delicate, they would fall off. So by, by tradition and for practical reasons, so the, it preserves all the, the very um, breakable body parts, we put it in a liquid preservative, in this case, ethanol or alcohol. And in fact, uh, Charles Darwin, when he took his voyage on the beetle, on the beagle, they used alcohol to preserve specimens he collected as well. And in their case, it was probably rum that they used because they had rum available, a drinking kind, a kind of drinking alcohol. They had rum on board for the sailors and they used it also to preserve their specimens. But that's what the liquid is. Excellent. Great question, Miss Keating's class. So, uh, Dr. Cushing, you do a lot of research on arachnids, but there is like we know in science, constantly new information coming out, Absolutely. right? So do we know everything there is to know about arachnids? No, no, not at all. In fact, arachnids are a hugely diverse group of organisms, of animals. There are well over 100,000 species of arachnids, scorpions, daddy long legs and mites and ticks are another uh, group. Daddy long legs are in the order of pileones. And, and uh, Tim, maybe we could put up a picture of uh, daddy long legs on the screen. Uh, so daddy long legs are in the order of pileones, mites and ticks are in the order acari, and I think we have some cool pictures of mites and ticks. So all of those arachnids, the ones I showed you and the ones you're seeing on the screen, this is a, a tick with, a, with its eggs. 
There's a well over 100,000 species. There's over 49,000 described species of spiders on Earth, and that number's increasing all the time. So a super diverse group of organisms, and yet worldwide, there's only about five or 600 scientists who are specialized, who are arachnologists, specialized on doing research on these animals. So we still have a long way to go to understand about their natural history, their biology, their behavior, all aspects of their of their biology we still have a long way to go lots and lots of questions and so speaking of behavior there's that new the new family yeah. of arachnid that was just discovered and we were talking about it and they have really cool behavior can you talk to the absolutely let me let me see if i can show it to you this is a um i work in with small animals so one of the things that we have to use to study the animals that i study are microscopes so that's what you're seeing here you're seeing one of the microscopes and this one happens to be hooked up to a to a camera so that I can project images of what uh, of what um, I'm studying onto the screen. So I'm going to put one of these spiders up on the screen actually in my dish and hopefully show you one of these spiders that Amanda's talking about. And this is a really cool spider. It's a tiny little thing. But what's cool is that my colleague Norm Horner and his student, they just collected this spider years and years ago, decades ago, and it was found near an ant nest. And it's only been collected in the vicinity close to ant nests. They didn't know, they couldn't identify this, this spider, this species. And so they sent samples of this spider to arachnologists all over the world, including to me, and none of us could identify it. None of us could even figure out what family it belonged in. And so recently in 2019, a colleague named uh, Martin Ramirez, he and some colleagues used DNA analysis to study this spider and to compare it to other existing families and species and found that it is really super different from all known families, which means that this spider was placed into its very own family. And we called the family the Marmicotoridae. Marmico refers to its affinity with, with ants, the fact that it lives near ant colonies. And the species, we called it Marmicotor chihuahuensis because it was found in the Chihuahuan Desert. So we described the family, we placed it in its own family. And what's really cool and really exciting because it's a paper, a scientific paper that is in press with a journal. So it's, this is hot off the press, almost off the press research, is my colleague Norm Horner and I went down, collected some, some uh, specimens of live spiders, introduced them to a Petri dish with, with ants, and what we discovered is that these spiders that you see on the screen, they are ant specialists, meaning they are marmicophages. They specialize on hunting ants. And they do that by rushing in from behind the ant, bite it, a rear leg of the ant. Then the spider backs off, allows the venom to take effect. The ant, once the ant is paralyzed, the spider reapproaches the ant grabs it, carries it off to feed on it. And if a live ant approaches the spider that has in its jaws a dead ant, the spider will twist its body around and present the living ant with the dead ant and using the dead ant as a shield so it's not attacked by the live ant. So cool. Super cool. Super cool. I am always fascinated by insects and their behavior and just animals and their behavior. Yeah. Um, so somebody asked, how do spiders get their name? You already kind of got into it with this particular spider, but in general, how do we classify spiders and then how do we name spiders? So we classify them by doing the work that I just described. So we compare them morphologically. We look at the anatomy of the, of the specimen that we collect and we compare it to the anatomy of known species to see if it's the same if it has similar morphological characteristics or anatomical characteristics. If it's super different, if it's very different characteristics, and we are convinced that it's a species new to science, these days we may use DNA analysis like we use with the spider 
to verify that it really is something new and different. And if we are still convinced it's new and different, then the scientists who discovered it gets to name it. If they go through that process of describing this, the spider, comparing it to known species and writing the species description, then what we do is we designate one specimen as what, as what we call the holotype, the type specimen, and that is the name holder. So the species description is based upon that specimen. It could be a male, could be a female, but that is the most important specimen. And then we can come up with a name for that, that species. My favorite name that I've ever uh, helped create was a sulfugid, one of these arachnids that I said we're doing a lot of research on. And the type specimen was collected at the Nevada test site, which is where early on in the 1950s, we tested nuclear explosions and set off nuclear blasts. So we determined that this new species of camel spider was in the genus Hemeratreca, but we wanted to honor the work that had been done at the Nevada test site. So we called it Hemeratreca kabumi <laughs> in honor of the nuclear explosions that were set off at the site. That's one of my favorite names. <laughs> don't say scientists don't have personalities. Uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Paula, you have a spider named after you, don't you? I have, yes, um, and, which is a great honor. So I've, I've done a lot of work on these spiders that are associated with ants. So I have a, an ant mimicking spider that was named after me. I also have a fossil sulfugid that's named after me. And some colleagues also um, uh, honored me with the name of a little mygalomorph, a little tarantula-like spider. So it's, which means a lot. It means that you're, you're uh, hopefully it means you're well-respected in your field <laughs> and your colleagues respect the work and the research that you do and the contributions you make as a scientist. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I wanted you to just toot your own horn yeah, for thanks. a minute. That's all. <laughs> um, so I think this is a good time to lead into our first poll. Sure. Um, so students, Classrooms, kids at home, you're going to have a poll pop up on your screen in a second here. There it is. So we want to know, how do arachnids help the natural world? Do they control insect populations, serve as prey for birds, mammals, and reptiles, live in habitats worldwide, or all of the above? So we're going to give you guys about a minute to uh, put your input in on that. And while we're waiting, Paula, do you have the capacity to answer another question? You bet I do. Awesome. They're rolling in here. So let me find one. Um, our specimens, do these critters die naturally? So, well, uh, certainly, I mean, in nature, they die naturally. <laughs> but for the specimens that we have in our collection, for the most part, we're out there collecting them. So we, we catch them in vials and we kill them in alcohol. Okay. And we don't like to kill them, but it's the only way to study their anatomy. They're small animals. You can't hope to hold on to a live spider that's wriggling around and be able to see what we call the diagnostic characters, the, the bits and pieces of the body structure that we need to be able to see in detail in order to figure out what species it is. Got it. Got it. Um, we have somebody asking, what's the most deadly spider? So the most uh, dangerous spider to humans, and I, and I, should, I should mention that there are over 49,000 described species of spiders on Earth, and there's only a handful that have venom that's, that's of medical importance to humans, very few. Um, all, almost all spiders have venom, so they're all venomous, but very few have venom that's important to, that's, that's uh, detrimental or bad for humans. The one that is, is quite dangerous is the Sydney funnel web spider that is found in Australia. And the Sydney funnel web spider is pretty big. It gets about an inch or so or more in size. And it not only has very dangerous venom that can kill people, but it also tends to be a bit aggressive. And so it's sort of a double whammy. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. We have the results of the poll. We've got some saying uh, control insect populations. Some say serve as prey for birds, mammals, and reptiles. And a lot of people saying all of the above. It is all of the above. And it uh, looks like nobody chose uh, live in habitats worldwide, but that is true. They, they, are, uh, they do, in fact, live in, in, especially in terrestrial habitats all over the world. They are important as food for any, any animal that eats 
arthropods that eats those creepy crawlies. So that includes some birds, that includes some mammals, it includes some reptiles. If they can catch an arachnid, they'll readily eat it just like they would an insect. They are important control factors for insect populations. So spiders alone are, there, there was an um, estimate done by some colleagues a couple of years ago who wanted to find out just how important are spiders in controlling insect populations. And they estimated, and maybe uh, Kim, uh, Tim can pop this up on the screen, but they estimated that the worldwide population of spiders is responsible for eating 400 to 800 million tons of prey annually. And in the same paper, they, they estimated how many tons of protein the human population worldwide was eating. And they estimated the human population is only eating about 200 million tons. So spiders are, are responsible for eating twice as much protein in the form of insects as humans do. <laughs> and we all know how much humans love to yeah, eat. So absolutely. that's a pretty, pretty impressive number. So we know spiders um, eat a lot of things. But they are also they also are food for other things, absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah, right? absolutely. So, you know, they're, they're important out there. They're definitely important. Yeah, for sure. Um, you said arachnids all over the world. Yeah. Where do we find spiders? So you find arachnids. spiders in all terrestrial environments in in the world except Antarctica. Although if you broaden that and look at the arachnid distribution, I believe there's some mites that are found in Antarctica. So you see arachnids everywhere. And there are some mites that live underwater. So they are aquatic. And recently, some colleagues published a paper where I, I should say that uh, horseshoe crabs and a fossil group called Eurypterids and the sea organism called Pycnogonids or sea spiders are were thought to be broadly related to arachnids because they had similar mouth parts and they, they had mouth parts called chelicerae. So they were chelicerate organisms, but outside that class arachnida until a colleague, a colleague and, his, and his crew published a paper where they used different lines of evidence, including DNA analysis. And their, their analyses suggested that horseshoe crabs may be another order within the class arachnida. They may be an order of arachnids. Now that uh, hypothesis is still being debated, uh, that's still being tested, whether there's good support for that. But right now, it could be, if, that, if that proves to be well-supported hypothesis, then arachnids really do live everywhere, including in a marine environment, if we consider horseshoe crabs as arachnids. There you go. That actually leads perfectly into uh, Emily Kelp's their group's next question. So does a Japanese spider crab classify as a spider or a crab? And or is it simply a misnomer? It's a misnomer. It's so the Japanese spider crab would be a crustacean. So it's in that phylum arthropoda, phylum arthropoda, and, but it's in it's in the crustacea, not in the in the class arachnida. Awesome. Awesome. Paula, more more questions All right. coming at Bring you. Them on. Bring All right. On. Um, let's see, Ms. Keating's class wants to know, is it dangerous to catch the specimens? No, it's not. Um, as I mentioned, there's, you know, over 49,000 described species of spiders. Very few are harmful to humans. You do have to be careful when they do, they are venomous. So if you get bitten by them, and I've been bitten a couple times, it can hurt. Um, for the, the animal that's, that Tim just showed on the screen is one of those whip scorpions, which don't even have venom. So really amongst the arachnids, you've got scorpions that have venom in their tail and you've got spiders that have venom in their, in their cephalothorax, their head region. So those are the only two that could envenomate you. Um, but when you catch them, you know, usually sometimes I'll just grab them, especially if it's something like a sulfugid, the camel spider that doesn't have venom, I just grab it with my hand. If it's a spider, I'll trap it with a vial and then, and then preserve it in alcohol. I first examine it to see if it's an adult. Um, and if it's a juvenile, I let it go. If it's an adult that I know I can identify the species and I'll collect it. But I'm careful when I collect them. But even with spiders, I oftentimes will just pick them up. I did have something cool happen in the field uh, this past year. We were, my student and I were out in the desert. We were collecting and I found a, 
burrowing wolf spider and he was just beautiful. He was shiny, bluish body. I didn't end up collecting him because I just couldn't bring myself to, to do that. But I did grab him so I could look at him in my vial. And as I went down to grab him, he reared up to expose his fangs. And when I put him in a clear plastic vial, I looked at him with my magnifying glass and there were two droplets of venom dripping from his fangs. It was very dramatic. <laughs> it's like a scene from he a was, movie. He was definitely ready to nail me. <laughs> He's not happy with you. Not thrilled, not ready to be picked up. Um, a lot of these questions are revolving around your, your research. So um, Tracy Reagan's class, wants to know, has she traveled all over the world to study them or are they brought to the museum for her to study? Uh, both. So I've had colleagues who send me specimens to be incorporated in our collection, but I also do a ton of field work. So I have traveled to habitats and deserts all over the United States. So the Western states where, where our desert environments, the Sonoran, the Chihuahuan, the Great Basin Desert, um, and I do, I do field work there and collect specimens myself. We've also traveled down to the deserts of northern Mexico and done work down there. So it's both, both through field work as well as by accepting specimens that are sent by colleagues. All right, Emily Kelp's group wants to know what's your most, what has been your most important finding and what is the craziest finding? So the, I think the most important finding, and I'll just pull this off our, our fridge, so we used a few years ago, we, in studying the camel spiders, we're studying the, the species relationships amongst the species that are in one family, the family of Remabatidae. And I was able to use DNA analysis to really re-examine how the different species, about 200 species in that family, are related to one another. So that was, a, that was pretty exciting because this is the first time that uh, what we call a phylogenetic tree or a, a, a systematics work, phylogeny was, was published on any family within the group Solofugi. So that was a real contribution to the field. I think the coolest discovery was this recent discovery about this mystery spider and the fact that we knew nothing about its biology. And then we realized that it was an ant, uh, an ant predator. And it's just so cool to be in the field, doing an experiment in the field, and realize that the observations you're making, no one ever had made those observations before. So you're discovering some component of the biology and the natural history of a species on Earth that no one knew before. That is just thrilling to me. Yeah, that's got to be something, something real special. Um, we still have a lot of questions rolling in, but since a lot of these are revolving around your research, mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about it. So sure. uh, your main area of focus is on camel spiders and they are neither camels nor are they spiders. Correct. Um, so we're gonna stick a poll up on the screen because we want the kids to kind of guide where we take um, this next step. So we're gonna pop a poll up. What about camel spiders would you guys like to explore? How they feed, how they smell, or how they survive? So how they feed, how they smell, or how they survive. In the meantime, Paul, I'm gonna give you one question. All right. What's the biggest spider? So the biggest spider on earth is probably Theraphosa blondi, and it is the uh, bird-eating tarantula from South America. And we actually have some preserved specimens that once the pole goes down, we'll show you. And the bird-eating tarantula is called a bird-eater because it's big enough to eat birds, but it rarely does. So its primary food, just like with all spiders, are insects. But it grows to be about, oh, I'd say three inches in body length. And then the leg span itself uh, is about the size of a dinner plate. So it's, it's very large. That's not small at all. Um, all right. Why don't, while we wait for the, for those last minute results to come in, how long have you been an arachnologist? Colin would like to know from Ms. Johnson. Oh, thanks, Colin. So uh, I, when I was little, I always was interested in the natural world. And I decided I wanted to do research and be a biologist really early on when I was just a kid. And when I was in high school, I grew up out east and I, um, Actually, let's, let me interrupt myself yeah, and show you. 
Yeah. Looks like the poll results are back. Yeah. So we can show here the, the bird wing or the uh, bird eating tarantulas. So when I was in high school, I grew up out east and I got an internship at the Smithsonian Institution's Insect Zoo. And I started to learn about insects and about spiders then. And then when I went to college, I did volunteer work with a professor in the biology department at Virginia Tech who did research on spiders. And I got very excited about the field because very few scientists are arachnologists and yet it's a very super diverse group. So I knew that in terms of doing research, there would be lots and lots and lots of research questions that I could ask. Like uh, I would never run out of questions and research that I could do. So I've been doing research on arachnids since I was professionally, since I was a freshman in college. Uh, and you have just done arachnids, right? There's another yes. question. Yep. Just arachnids. Yep. All right, Paula, here we go. Um, it looks like most people want to want to find out how they survive sure okay and 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 i'll answer even though nobody was interested they smell very sweet <laughs> <laughs> so it's my little arachnid joke uh so they survive so sulfugids and maybe pop up a, a picture of sulfugids on the screen tim <clears throat> so sulfugids we they live they're mostly nocturnal they mostly are active at night during the daytime they will live in underground burrows or underneath objects in the desert uh, habitats where they're found. So they live underneath rocks, underneath logs, or in burrows underground. They come out at night to hunt. And when they hunt, they, they move like the wind and they move without stopping. So they are out there very actively trying to find insects to grab hold of. When they find an insect to eat, they will grab it with their pedipalps and their legs. And the tips of the pedipalps have these, these pop-out organs called suctoral organs that they use to pull the smooth body of the insect closer to their chelicery, to their jaws. Once they pull the insect prey close, then they tear it apart with their jaws. Then they regurgitate, they vomit, digestive enzymes onto the body of that torn up insect prey those enzymes break down and liquefy the tissue of the prey, and then they suck up that pre-liquefied, pre-digested meal. So that's how they feed. How they find one another in order to mate and reproduce, we're not really sure. Maybe, probably, they're using sex, sexual pheromones, uh, sexual signals that they produce and that waft through the environment or they might lay trails, um, uh, pheromone trails on the ground. But one way or another, the males and the females find each other, they mate, and then the females will lay their eggs in burrows underground. The eggs hatch, the little babies are these very helpless little larval forms that take a couple of molts in order to be, there's the larvae on the screen. So it takes a couple of molts for them to be hard enough and, um, and the, their jaws hard enough for them to hunt for themselves. Then they start to hunt. They go through several other molts until they're mature. And, uh, and then their life cycle begins again. How long they live, we're not sure. Probably a, a year, maybe from hatch through maturity, maybe more than that, maybe a couple years. Um, yeah, so that's basically how they, they make their way in the world. They smell. Um, using hair-like CD that are covering their, their pedipalps. So they use those hair-like CD to pick up chemical signals that are wafting through the air. And they also have these really cool organs that I'm going to try to show you on the screen that are called malleoli. And the, my, my microscope has not been behaving very well, but these are the malleoli. So we're looking at the underside of the body, and these leaf-like structures are the malleoli. And they drag those malleoli on the ground as they're moving, and those malleoli are picking up chemical signals from insects uh, or from each other as they're walking and moving through the environment. So I've, I've seen sulfugids uh, moving along the ground, and then they back up, and then they start to dig, and sure enough, there's an insect right, right below the surface of the sand. And I'm pretty sure that they were able to tell the insect was there because they were picking up the signals from the insect using those malleoli. So that's how they, they smell. 
All right, Paula, do you have some time? We're getting more questions. Absolutely. Bring All them, right. Bring them All up. right. So first of all, Mr. Bloodgood's class would like to know, are earwigs arachnids? No, earwigs are insects. They are not arachnids. True. So they, if you look at the number of legs that earwigs have, six legs, not eight legs, three body parts, not two. Awesome. Uh, let's see. How many poisonous spiders are there? So just about what they really mean is how many venomous spiders are there, how many have venom. And pretty much every spider on earth has venom. So all spiders have venom glands, except for those in one family that have lost their venom glands. But otherwise, every spider you see out there is venomous. Now, how many are venomous or have venom that's harmful to humans? Very few, maybe 10, maybe 100 species worldwide of those 49,000 species. But very few have venom that, that harms us. It might hurt if you get bit by, by a spider, especially if it's a big spider, because you've got two little needle-like structures going into you. The black widow that you see on the screen, that's the one species that we have here in Colorado. We have the Western black widow, and that is the one species we have that has venom of medical importance to humans. And the black widow has something called uh, latrodectin in its venom that, that can cause it's a neurotoxin, so it can cause pain if you get bitten by a black widow, pain throughout the body. It feels like somebody's been kicking you in the stomach over and over again. Your stomach muscles kind of tighten up and you've got pain in the lymph nodes, pain in your gut, facial contortions, sweating, just pain throughout the body. You probably won't die from a black widow bite, but you might wish you were dead because it can be really painful. <laughs> but they're very timid and very unlikely to bite unless they're seriously provoked, unless you trap one between your hands or between your body and an object and the spider feels like that's the only way out is to is to try to bite awesome so we have a, a question from miss brokaw's class and um emily kelps are both curious about the trapdoor spider so miss brokaw's class wants to know have you researched the trapdoor spider and emily kelps group um want to know how they eat Oh, great question. So I have not personally done research on the trapdoor spiders. And there are, there are actually, there's one family of spider that builds a, a trapdoor. And what that means is that they build a silk lined underground burrow. And then they, and I don't know if we have beef footage of the trapdoor spider, but they have a, a silk lined underground burrow. And then they build a postage stamp size, a little circular door that is also silk lined. And they keep the door shut with their fangs. So they put their fangs into the silk and hold the door shut. But outside that burrow, there are little silk lines emanating from the burrow entrance. So if an insect walks past those silk lines, they're basically trip lines, and the spider inside the burrow can feel the movement because everything is silk lined, it knows something is outside the burrow and it will throw the door open and rush out, grab the insect and drag it back into the burrow. One time I was in Trinidad and Tobago and I wanted a picture of a trapdoor spider. So I took a camel hair brush and I was teasing it. I knew the silk lines would be outside the burrow and the door. So I was teasing it. And I tell you that spider, it threw open the door so fast and rushed out to grab whatever it was, which was my camel hair brush, that it startled me. And I screamed like a girl and threw the paintbrush <laughs> in the air and then calmed myself down and got a nice photograph. <laughs> <laughs> See, even people who study arachn arachnids can get, still get freaked out yeah, by arachnids. Yeah, just a little. Just they get little. you off guard sometimes, yeah, yeah, you know? Me too, me too. Uh, we have a couple people asking, what's the smallest spider? Oh, that's a good question. The, the smallest spider as an adult is probably a millimeter and a half in size. So that is just less than a fraction of a quarter of an inch. I mean, teeny, Ooh. teeny, tiny, about the size of a of the uh, pencil, uh, the lead from a pencil. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That's very tiny. That's very tiny. <laughs> For sure. Um, let's see. Who, who was it? This was a great question. Alex. Alex from Miss Johnson's class asked, do any spiders live with other insects? Oh, great question, Alex. Uh -huh. Yes. So uh, one of the, the, the research I did as a graduate student when I was a PhD is I was fascinated with stories that I'd heard about spiders that live inside ant colonies. And so I found, uh, I found a system, a, a, an ant called Begonomir mixbadius that lives in Florida, and it had one of these symbiotic spiders that lived in its colony. It, the spider had been discovered by somebody else, by um, 
uh, his name, I'm blanking on his name, but he's, another researcher had discovered the spider but had not named this new species. So I got to name it. And so I named it, Masankas was the genus name, Masankas pogonophilus, because it loved Pogona myrmex ants, pogonophilus. And that spider spent all of its life cycle inside the ant colony. And when the ants would pick up and move and establish a new colony, those little spiders would come out of the nest and march right along in the column of ants to the new colony site. It would feed on little tiny soil arthropods that also lived inside the ant colonies. So yeah, there's a good example of spiders that live with other, other organisms. All right, Ms. Keating's class wants to know, why do some spiders make webs and can all spiders make webs? Oh, that's a great question. So some spiders, there, there are, all spiders make silk. So silk production is common to every spider on earth, but not all spiders use that silk to make prey capture webs. So the spiders that make prey capture webs, some of them in one family make the Charlotte's web, the round orb web. Uh, and, and they catch, they are specialized in catching aerial insects, flies and other flying insects. Then there are spiders like the black widow that builds a cobweb. And we have our black widow here. And the black widow builds a messy cobweb. And it has silk lines, sticky silk lines that extend down to the ground. And those silk lines will catch, um, they will catch uh, ground dwelling insects that are walking below. And, and uh, when the beetle trips the line, it breaks and the spider can catch the insect. And what, what, what was the question? Did I uh, answer the question? Do all, <laughs> um, it's like I'm going off on Do some tangent. spiders make, why do some spiders make webs and can all make webs? Oh, right. So they, can't, they cannot all make webs. They all can make silk. Uh, the, they do make webs because webs are a really very effective way to catch insects. So the spiders, the, they build the webs and then they don't have to spend any more energy. The web is gonna do all the work in catching the insects. All right, um, let's see. Abel would like to know what is the most unusual arachnid? Wow. Um, what do you think the most unusual arachnid? I think one of these is the most unusual. Like, I, I am fascinated by these two. The, the vinegaroon on in this hand and the the um, whips whip spider in this hand the amble pigeon and the thelophonida are just so cool looking you guys might recognize the amble pigeon because it was used in the harry potter movie the cruciatus oh. curse so they did the cruciatus curse oh. on a poor little amble fake amble, i'm sure it's fake <laughs> amble pigeon but that was that was painful for an arachnologist to watch that scene Aww. But these are really cool. They're just so otherworldly looking and just they're cool. Uh, yeah. In general, arachnids are cool, but these guys in particular. All right, we have just two more quick questions. Quick answer. Let's it's like lightning round. What's your favorite and least favorite spider? I don't have one. I, I just like them all. I like them all. All right. And then um, are there any spiders that don't lay eggs? Oh, that's a good question. No, they all, that's a really good question. They all lay eggs. That's, that's how they reproduce now. That's for spiders. For other arachnids, uh, like scorpions, scorpions don't lay eggs. Their eggs hatch inside the body and they basically give birth to live young. Whoa. Yeah. That's and then the babies crawl up on the, on the mother scorpion's back and hitch a ride until they're cool. old enough to hunt. Yeah. That's cool. And then um, to go along with babies, Eggs, how many spider, how many eggs do spiders typically lay? It depends on the species of spider, how many eggs they lay. So something like the black widow can produce uh, maybe 300 eggs per egg sac and can produce four or five egg sacs. So that's over a thousand babies that it can produce. But a tiny little spider, like somebody asked, what's the tiniest spider? That little millimeter and a half big spider is probably only has one egg in its silken egg sac. If it's slightly bigger, maybe it has one to seven eggs. So it really depends on the species. Awesome. All right. That is all the time we have for right. today. You guys had a lot of really good questions and there's still a lot of really good ones in the chat. So I'm going to put that back on you guys. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question, 
maybe you guys can do some research in your own classroom as a group and try and answer those questions that you asked. Um, before we go, Paula, let's say you triggered a love of arachnids and some kids or even some of their teachers. What are some advice you could, uh, some bits of advice you could give those guys? Yeah, so the be best advice I can give to kids or adults or anybody who's interested in, in science and nature is just foster a sense of curiosity. So be curious and, and watch what's going on all around you. Uh, you don't have to go to faraway places to study these animals. Spiders are everywhere. So just go out into your schoolyard, go out into your backyard. It, even if you're in an apartment complex, find a park that's nearby or find a grassy patch and see what's living there. Because these arthropods, these arachnids are living all over the place. Go out in the early morning and look for webs and just, just watch their behavior. If you want, you can you can collect some, bring them into the classroom. Black widows make great great uh, great pets. You just put them in a jar, watch what they do, throw some insects in, watch them prey. If you find a male, watch a mate. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do if you're interested in studying these animals. You heard but it here first. Be curious. Be yeah. curious and stay curious. You heard it here first. Black widows make great pets. <laughs> Go home and try and sell that to your adults. <laughs> All right. We want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Paula, for all of that information. Um, next week, we have another scientist in action. It is called Science in the Sky. We are heading over to the National Center for Atmospheric Research to hang out in their uh, airplane hangar and learn more about the airplanes that they use to help us study Earth's atmosphere. So check that out for sure. Otherwise, have a great day, guys. Thanks for joining us.